Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 40. Again, that's Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. But when the Son of Man comes into his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on a glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the fountain of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? Then the king will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did this to one of my brethren, one of my brothers, even the least of them you did it to me. I don't know if you paid attention to what just happened, but you just got to see two fathers and their two sons leading us in worship, and that's always encouraging to me. Somebody asked this morning, is Kevin preaching? And the answer was yes, and then the comment was made, well, then we know how long it's going to be. I don't know how long the lesson's going to be this morning. Again, I seem to be nursing a weak voice this morning. So I have my handful of cough drops. I have my bottle of water back here ready to go. Uh, I'm pretty prepared, but I'm not going to be speaking as loudly as normal. So the guys in the sound room, they're going to adjust accordingly. Hopefully, you can hear me just fine if I shimmy up next to this microphone and speak into it. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been a stranger? Have you ever been the one on the outside looking in? Have you ever been that kid at the lunch table that nobody sat with? Or maybe you were that person that was new to a job or a place like that where you work and you didn't know anybody and you didn't know the routines and all of the other people were kind of together. They knew each other and they knew what was going on and so you kind of felt a little bit left out. Maybe you have been a visitor to a worship assembly like we are a part of right now. We may have some guests here today who are here for the very first time. And I want to ask you that question. How do you think they feel? Do they feel welcome? Do they feel wanted? I remember years ago, just before my family moved here, in the bulletin, the church bulletin, prior to our arrival, Ken Joins wrote an article that I treasure to this day. But he wrote a bulletin article challenging you to look at things from our standpoint. Because you live here. You're already a part of this community, a part of this congregation. You're very comfortable. But we were coming in as strangers. And so he encouraged this congregation to welcome us and to embrace us. And that's exactly what happened. My personality type is one to go in and make friends no matter what, but not everyone has that personality type. Sometimes people come in and they are simply quiet and they observe, and the question is, are they made to feel welcome? You know, when we think about incidences uh, in the Bible, we think about situations that we'll talk about people who were in need of attention, people who were in need of help, people who were in need of encouragement. And sometimes people took advantage of those opportunities to assist. On the other hand, sometimes people would not take advantage of that opportunity to assist. And therefore, they passed by a, the possibility of a great work and maybe even a great relationship. I'm going to ask you to consider something for just a moment. I'm going to ask you to consider picking up people on the side of the road. 
Not something I'm necessarily going to go encourage you to do, but at the same time, I've never been discouraged from doing it. Uh, when I see people in need, I, I try to help out, and I try to be wise about it. I try to be smart about it. I try to be mindful of those things, but not everybody on the side of the road is uh, packing a sawed-off shotgun in their hollow leg. And, but we live in a skeptical society, and we seem to suggest that every single person on the side of the road that might be in need seems to be packing. Well, that may not necessarily be the case, but I want to share with you a story that happened right here in Highlands County. When I drive north to the church building every workday, I drive north on Highway 27. And this is the dash cam from a vehicle that was driving north on Highway 27 several months ago in September of 2022. And it was on this day that this particular young man and his girlfriend, whom he had just picked up at the airport in Miami, were driving home to, their, uh, to his home in Lakeland. And it was on this road that suddenly, out of nowhere, a downpour occurred. One of those where you literally drive into it. And because the cruise control was set, because they were going right along the highway, when that downpour occurred, all of that rain mixed with all of that oil that, and residue that's on the road, and immediately this is what happened. The car spun around in a 360 and landed on the side of the road. Interestingly enough and, and blessed enough, they were both fine. Uh, the young man and the young lady were fine. They just really were a little bit in shock, a little bit scared. You would be too if you just did a donut in the middle of the highway at full speed. But they landed on the side of the road. They were fine, but the car was pretty messed up and it was not going to drive away. I did not actually witness that accident, but I came along about 60 seconds later, and I noticed this couple on the side of the road, and I could tell the car was bent up, and I could tell that something had just happened, and because I, too, drove into that downpour, I put two and two together, and I figured out what was going on. I had an opportunity that day. I had an opportunity given to me by God to do something for somebody else. I could have driven on by could have decided, I don't want to get out and get wet. I don't want to be involved. Maybe I've got a, an appointment to get to, and so I'm going to do that. But then I'm mindful of this passage in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. This passage of Scripture that reads, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, I'm not suggesting that the young man and the young lady were angels, I'm not suggesting that at all. I think there is a better understanding of that. We'll look at that in just a little bit. But again, I did see an opportunity, and it was an opportunity to help out, and that's exactly what I did. I pulled over, asked them if they needed some uh, help, and they were still a little shook up, but they said yes. I said, why don't you jump into my car, get out of the rain, I'll bring you up to the church building. The young man called his parents, who live in Lakeland, remember, and we stayed at the church building, and, and I got them some food. That seems to be one thing we've got a lot of around here. Got them some food, got them some drink. We enjoyed visiting for some time. And then uh, his parents showed up, and they picked him up and took both of them back to Lakeland safely and soundly. In the days to come, I had the opportunity to help to make sure that his car was where it needed to be at an auto body shop where it could be repaired or whatever. Uh, I also developed a great relationship uh, with that young man. And it was that young man who eventually last semester at the Florida School of Preaching there in the church building of the South Florida Avenue Church of Christ, we, we offered that Financial Peace University class that we talk about so much. And he decided he wanted to be a part of that. So he came and, and took that class with us. And so we have continued a relationship that has grown into a friendship. And that is the blessing that I get to receive. The Bible teaches us if you sow, you will reap. And you'll reap what you sow. And so here we had an opportunity given to us. We took advantage of it, and it has been a blessing to us ever since. 
So what I want you to consider this morning from that passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, I want us to talk about very specifically showing hospitality to strangers. One of the things we talk about from a passage of Scripture in Galatians is to do good to all people and especially to those of the household of the faith. And this is very true. We need to pay special attention to those whom we do know, those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's realize that the Bible also says we cannot turn aside to those we do not know. To those who are strangers in our midst, we need to give them special time and attention. Whether that's a welcome and a handshake or whether that's a, a lift off the side of the road because of an accident that has just occurred. So take a look, if you will, Hebrews chapter 13. And we're going to take a look at that passage of Scripture in just a moment. But I want us to define, as we begin the lesson this morning, this word hospitality. I challenged our Wednesday night class not too many weeks ago to define this word. I want to give you a more literal translation or literal, literal definition that comes to us from dictionary.com off of the Internet. And it reads, the definition is the friendly reception and treatment of guests or strangers, the quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests and strangers in a warm, friendly, generous way. Now please notice in the two definitions that are given up there, both of them talk about two categories of people. One is that friendly reception and treatment of guests. That second definition includes the quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests in a warm, friendly manner. When we're talking about guests, when we're talking about people we know, when we're talking about people who come to visit us, they come to our home or they come to our place of worship or they come to our business, when it is a guest, we typically refer to that kind of person as somebody we know. And that's often very easy to receive and welcome somebody we know because we're often looking forward to their arrival. But did you notice in both definitions this definition applies to strangers as well? The friendly reception and treatment of strangers, the quality or disposition of receiving and treating strangers in a warm, friendly, and generous way. The idea here is that we are, in fact, to be kind to all people. We are to do good for all people. We are to minister to all people. And that includes the vast majority of those people who are not even known to us. People that we've never laid eyes on before. People we've never talked to before. People we've never gone out to eat with or worshipped with before. We need to reach out to those people that are strangers in our midst and let them know how much they are loved. The reason this is so important is because this is what God did for us. We were described in Scripture as strangers to Him because of our sin. He looked upon us as someone he did not know or did not have fellowship with because of our sin. But at the right time, Jesus Christ died for us, allowing those of us who would listen to and obey the gospel plan of salvation to be welcomed into the family of God where we would be received with the greatest of love. Well, that is the definition. Let's go back to our scripture. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 reads, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. That word neglect means to abandon or desert. Uh, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now based on your translation, that entertained angels is written in a little bit of a different way and sometimes people are confused. I do not believe that it means that somebody who walks into our assembly this morning is an angel. Remember, God ended that day and age of miracles at the end of the first century, thereabout in that time frame, when the Word of God was completely written down for us, giving, all, giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
So I don't think that we have a, an actual angel sitting in our midst this morning any more than I think we have an actual demon sitting in our midst this morning. This is referenced in the past tense. If you'll notice that passage of Scripture, it says, For by this some have entertained, past tense, angels without knowing it. And one of the great examples of where this is found is in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. And if you have your Bibles open, turn there with me, if you would, and let's read that. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. At this point in time, we have an episode in the life of Abraham and Sarah where Abraham comes across some strangers. And what he does next is really the basis of our lesson this morning. Genesis chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord appeared to him, talking about Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, where he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Then he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves after you, after all that you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. And he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. When you take a look at this passage of scripture, you see three strangers which we look at as probably being angels messengers of God who have come to check in on Abraham. And there are things that are going to follow, but it's Abraham's response to these people whom he's never laid his eyes on that I want us to focus on this morning. I want us to see if we can learn three lessons from how Abraham acts and interacts with these strangers that we might apply to our lives today so that we can fulfill that New Testament charge that we not neglect or abandon or desert those who are strangers to us, but to be hospitable to them, welcoming them and receiving them. I want you to consider how Abraham exemplified hospitality in this passage of Scripture, first and foremost, with haste. That means he hurried. And if you take a look at Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2, uh, when, this, when we read that J uh, Abraham was sitting by the oaks of Mamre when the Lord appeared, we read in verse 2, when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when they saw him, he ran to the tent door where the men were standing opposite him. He ran to them and bowed himself to the earth. We are often in a hurry to buy Christmas presents for the ones we love. Some of you start in January to prepare for the following December. You're often in a hurry to buy gifts for children in particular when they are going to have a birthday or some other celebration that's coming up. There are people who will make travel arrangements to go halfway around the world so that they can be a part of a festivity or a celebration with friends and loved ones. But here's the question. Are you excited about helping those you don't know? Are you excited about helping those people who look differently than you, who dress differently than you, who act differently than you, whose experiences and world stories are different from yours? Are you excited about that opportunity to turn a stranger into a friend? Because I believe that's the key to success. I believe that's the key to following in the footsteps of Jesus. Because if we look at the life of Jesus, 
It didn't matter whether he was with his own people, the Jews, with his own family, his mother and his brothers or sisters. No, it didn't matter if he was with a leper, someone with a terrible disease. It didn't matter if he found himself face to face with a Samaritan woman at a well, a blind man, or a group of people who hated him known as the Pharisees. Jesus always took advantage of the opportunity to reach out. And many of those people responded in kind. Many of those people followed him. Many of those people became his friends and his servants. Now, some of them didn't. In fact, many of them didn't. But for all that he reached out to, so many of them responded in kind. Jesus was always quick to help. Abraham was quick. He showed haste in going out to take care of these strangers who had found their way to his home. And that's something that I want us to, uh, to encourage us to do as well. I'm going to ask you to do something. You've got one finger in Genesis 18. Keep it there because we're now going to go back and forth between the Old and the New Testament. And we're going to take a look at a similar story in Luke 10. Luke 10 verses 30 through 32. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 32. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a New Testament story of Jesus's that demonstrates how we need to help those who are in need. Those, in this case, who are strangers. But don't let your religiosity get in the way. Yeah, I came up with that big word just for that statement. Don't let your idea of what you think is religion get in the way of what real religion is all about. I've heard so many people say before, I, I, don't, I don't buy into religion. I don't do religion. You know, the Bible talks about religion. God authored religion. He created one for us. It's called Christianity. So we need to be religious, but let's don't get our idea of what religion is in the way of what true religion is. If you take a look at Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 32, you're going to read about how not to do this. And we're going to read that from the example of the Levite and the other. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now think about that for just a moment. A priest and a Levite. Levite was from the tribe of Levi, from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were the ones from whom the priests would come. And we even have a priest here, someone who is from the line of Aaron, who is present here. And when they see this man who has been robbed and beaten and left for dead, when these religious people show up, they can't be bothered. That can't be their concern. Either they figured somebody else would take care of him or they assumed maybe nobody would take care of him and he wasn't worth taking care of in the first place. They walked on by the other way. Let me say to all of us this morning, this is not the example of what we want to be. We don't want to be like the priest and the Levite. We don't want to be the person who sees someone in need, whether it's on the side of the road or whether it's somebody who has made their way to this church building and this assembly without any invitation or provocation whatsoever from any one of us. They've just found their way here, but they're in need. Maybe they're in need of friendship. Maybe they're in need of some food. Maybe they're just in need of encouragement because the world in which they live doesn't provide it. They feel very alone. They feel very ostracized. They're like that kid eating alone at that lunch table. There seems to be no one who wants to spend time with them. Brethren, we can't be like the priest and the Levite. We need to be like Abraham who saw an opportunity to serve and jump to it. 
He demonstrated his hospitality with haste, not looking around for someone else to do it for him, not looking for no doubt one of his many servants that he could assign this task to. He jumped to his feet and ran to see how he could aid, to see how he could welcome these strangers into his life as friends. Well, let's go back to Genesis 18 and let's consider that Abraham exemplified hospitality with humility. Did you notice what the very end of verse 2 reads? As soon as Abraham ran up to him, in verse 2 we read, when he saw him, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. He not only humbles himself before God, he humbles himself before these strangers, letting them know that he was nothing to be afraid of. He was only there to help. It's kind of interesting. Most of you know over the last two days, we handed out to the community, to people who were in need, not 3,000 pounds as you saw on the Facebook post, but 6,000 pounds of fresh blueberries. All of those fit in the back of my truck somehow, and we passed them out. Yesterday, I took the opportunity to literally drive around in my neighborhood. I had a few left. I had about 24 or so boxes of blueberries left, and I went around, and some of the neighbors I knew, I went up to them and said, hey, would you like that? But the really fun thing was going up to the people I've never met before and handing them out some blueberries. Now, when a stranger in the United States of America drives up in a big black pickup and parks right in front of your yard, gets out and approaches you, you're not knowing whether you should shake their hand or pull for your sidearm. We, we just don't know. And so as I walk up with my t-shirt that literally says Sebring Parkway Church of Christ, I had to kind of open my hands up and say, my name is Kevin Patterson. I preach for the Sebring Parkway Church of Christ. I have some fresh blueberries, and then I have to run in and jump in and say, hey, and by the way, they're free, because they immediately might think you are a salesman, a solicitor, someone trying to, but I said, I've got some free blueberries, and we're just giving them out. Could I give you some? There's this one lady by the name of Becky. She's like, oh, I would love that. And once she knew who I was, once she knew that I wasn't a threat, and once she knew all I wanted to do was serve, she felt so good about that. And I felt good about the opportunity that I had to shine my light before men. Not just before those of you I know, but before those that I didn't know. And now have had the opportunity to make a new relationship and foster a new friendship. This is the attitude that Abraham has from the beginning. He not only falls down on the ground before God, but falls down on the ground before these strangers and is thankful for this opportunity to be used. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 10 to the story of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, after the priest has walked on by, after the Levite has walked on by, after these fellas who were supposed to be the epitome of high Jewish religion, walk on by and ignore the man who has been beaten and left for dead, the hero of the story comes along. But he's not the hero that the Jews would have expected because he was a Samaritan, a half-breed, in their eyes less than a dog. He, he was a part of the, the people who had intermingled the bloodlines that God had told them under the law of Moses to keep pure. And so they looked down upon contempt. So when Jesus tells this story and uses a Samaritan as the hero of the story, you can only imagine how the people listening to him were cringing. But in verse 33, a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
You know, the first thing that we see about the Samaritan is not all of the expenses he was out, not all of the time that he was out. The very first thing that we read about the Samaritan is that he had compassion. He had compassion towards someone he didn't know, whose business was not his. He had compassion on someone who somebody else maybe could have come along and helped, but there was no guarantee that that was going to happen. The good Samaritan had compassion on the stranger. And it was his compassion, it was his attitude of humility towards someone who was in need. His feelings toward that person who had been hurt and left behind that prompted him to act. In verse 34, that's where we read that he came to him, he bandaged him, he poured oil and wine that would be like medicine on them, he does everything, and then he goes the extra mile, puts him on his own animal, and takes him to an inn and takes care of him. I have to ask this question in 2023, who does that? Who does that? Who has such compassion that they're willing to give up their day to not only nurse someone on the side of the road, to give up your own things, your own supplies, your bandages, your medicine, things that you might need on a long journey? Who gives up those things? And then on top of everything else, uh, gives up the animal that he was riding on. Now he's got to walk, but he's going to put this man on his animal so that he can take him to an inn, foster the expense of a hotel, and then take care of him while he's there. That's the attitude of humility that Abraham had, and that's the attitude of humility we need to have before those we do not know. Because those we do not know may be friends waiting to happen. They may be future brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't know. That's the purpose of Hebrews 13 and verse 2. Be careful because when you take care of a stranger, you may be taking care of not only the immediate opportunity, but the future blessing. The blessing of a, a brother and sister in Christ, someone who may be saved, the blessing of a good relationship and a good friend. But remember, in that person you don't know is the opportunity for a truly blessed future. So we have to have the attitude of humility. Then let's take a look at the last point. Abraham exemplified hospitality with honor. Take a look, if you will, Genesis chapter 18, verses 4 through 8. Genesis 18, verses 4 through 8. Notice what Abraham says. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. And he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Almost like a waiter standing by ready to serve in whatever way he could. Abraham honored these people. He did not honor them by saying, well, let me see, I've got a few coins in my pocket. Why don't you go into town and get, get a bite to eat? Now, he didn't say, you know, uh, I tell you what, I've got some things in here and goes into this pantry and gets some a couple of cans of pickled pig's feet and the other cans that are in there that expired 13 years ago. Here, uh, take these and go crack this open under a tree and, and uh, have a good day. He didn't do that. He honors them by giving the best he has to give. He takes care of them. He not only has his wife cooking in the kitchen this meal for them, he's out taking an animal for the purpose of serving to his guests, to these strangers whom he did not know, but strangers whom he honors. You know, when we jump to the New Testament, to Luke chapter 10 and verse 35, the story of the Good Samaritan, 
The part that always gets me, the part that I'm always mindful of is this very last description of the Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10 and in verse 35, we read on the next day, after he's taken care of this fellow, brought him to the end, on the next day, he took out two denarii. Now remember, a denarius was a coin, and that coin was worth a day's wage. So let's put it in our terms. What's a day's wage? Well, that's a relative term, a little subjective, because some people make more than others, some people make less than others. But let's maybe pick a reasonable round number. Let's just say 100 bucks a day. This would be tantamount to this Samaritan pulling out $200, not $2, not 20 bucks, $200. And he says, and he gives them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. The Samaritan honored the man who had been beaten and left for dead because he says, you are more important to me than my money. And the Bible has a lot to say about money. And a lot of times it talks about the dangers of money. Uh, not money itself, but the love of money, which Paul would write, is the source of all kinds of evil. When we love it, when we covet it, when we see that uh, that seems to be the most important thing in our life is accumulating it for our own possession. And rather what we need to be doing is sowing and reaping, giving so that God can give even more opportunity to bless us and more opportunity for us to bless others. When we see this passage of scripture and we see to what extent the Samaritan is willing to go, not the second mile, but the third and fourth mile, the Samaritan goes all out to honor this man he does not know. And what we don't read in this passage of Scripture is how the man who was beaten, how the man who was left for dead reacted in all of this. Was he conscious enough to see that religious priest walk on by? Were his eyes open enough to where he saw that priest, that Levite, look at them, make eye contact, but then maybe very quickly look away and continue on their journey. And what did he think about the Samaritan? What did he think about the Samaritan that went so far to do so much for him a mere stranger? It is so easy for us to honor those we know and honor those we've already chosen to love. The challenge for us in Scripture is to choose to love those we don't know. Because you see, that's how we fall into all of this with God. Yes, God knows who we are, but when we are, can, when we are separated from Him with our sin, He doesn't know us. This is the part of the story where we often talk about where Jesus will say on that great day of judgment to those who have lived sinful, unfaithful lives, where he says, depart from me, I never knew you. The idea is God wants to know us, but he can't have a relationship with us if we choose to live in sin. For those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus today, it means that we are to love the lovable, but we're to love the unlovable as well. We are to do good deeds for those we know, and we are to do good deeds for those we don't know. We have to remember that we are to show haste with great humility how quickly we want to honor those who are strangers in our lives. Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. Some of you who are a little bit older know that face, Will Rogers. Will Rogers was a great American personality in the 20th century. And he was known for saying several things, but one of his sayings is, a stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. 
Is that your attitude? I'd like to think that it's mine, but I've caught myself being a priest and a Levite on, a t on an occasion. Maybe when I was busy, maybe when I just made an assumption, maybe when my stereotypes or my prejudices got the better of me. But I'd like to think that I would be able to do a better job. I'd like to think that I can do a better job of looking at strangers as just friends I haven't met yet. As opportunities that God has put in my way, in my path, to go and actually do something, to, to serve somebody else in a way that would be pleasing to him. Remember that scene? That car going down that highway, cruise control set, hits the slick patch, starts to spin, there's the 180, and finally they land up on the side of the road having done a complete donut. They're not hurt. Car is permanently damaged, won't be recovered, it will be lost. God put an opportunity in my way that day. He's sitting right there next to Sherry. The young man that was in that accident that we ended up with, who took that class over in Lakeland, and who I texted the other day. I said, hey, can you send me that, ca uh, that camera f uh, uh, footage? I think I'd like to put that into a, a lesson. I said, in fact, when can you come over for it? He just right away, May 7th. I'm free from work, May 7th, I'll be there. Sure enough, he showed up this morning. His name is Cody. Make sure and meet him. He's a stranger you didn't know coming into this day, but now you know him a little bit better. Think about the other people who are around here. Think about the people who are present here today. There's a fellow that I found when I was doing some work on the internet, and, and he was referencing this very passage of Scripture. And he wrote the following. He said, we've all visited congregations where we didn't know anyone, so we know what that feels like. And I believe we all know how to make guests feel at home. But he says, when a visitor comes to services, he says, how about offering them this, a warm greeting? Talk to them. It's easy to talk to people you know, but go out of your way to talk to visitors and include them. Answer questions about the congregation, where things are, how we do things. Help them feel at home. Help them to connect to others in the congregation. For instance, if we find that we have common ground with others, Boy, here's a, here's a big one. Give up your seat so that the new family can sit together. We can't be giving up our seats. We've got assigned seats. My name's on that seat. I can't. No, no. Step back. Hastily humble yourself for the purpose of honoring others above yourself. Reach out and share a songbook with somebody. Reach out and share your Bible with somebody. When the Lord's Supper comes around later on and we're trying to get together this new way of doing things, uh, help them out. Help them out. Show them what to do and where to put the cup afterward when it's all said and done. Help them to understand what's going on. Make them feel welcome. Hey, invite them over to your house or out for a meal. That would be an amazing opportunity for us. But let's make sure that as Peter would write in 1 Peter 4 and verse 9, that we are hospitable to one another without complaint. That all goes back to our attitude. Let's make sure that we give others what we ourselves would want to be given if we were in their place. Visiting, out in the community, schoolmates, co-workers, people on the side of the road. They're looking for us. And we have the opportunity to show them God in our lives if we will only be willing and willing to act. Think about that passage of Scripture. Think about the opportunity. Not that we are concerned about angels being in our way or something like that, but I want you to think about that. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this... Some have entertained angels without knowing it. It is true that I don't think that there is going to be that literal angel manifesting himself 
in the here and now. But here's what I do know. God knows what we're doing. God knows where our hearts are and where they need to be. God is the one who is looking at us and he knows whether we are entertaining him, whether we are pleasing him with our thoughts and with our actions. So let's be hospitable. Be hospitable one to another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be there for each other. Be welcoming, be receiving. But those people we do not know, let's make sure that we reach out to them and let them know we care about them. Whether they are the people we've known all our lives or whether this is the first time we've ever met. This morning, let me ask you this question. Are you a child of God? If not, why not? Because there's no salvation outside of Christ. To those who have not by faith repented of their sins, confessed the name of Jesus, and been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins, that person is outside of Christ and that person is lost. Don't stay there. You don't have to stay there because God gave his life through his son on that cross. He died so that we might have the freedom from our sins, so that we might be washed clean in the blood of the lamb. So this morning, if you're not a child of God, take advantage of that. And if you are a child of God, there are a lot of things we can talk about what we all need to do. But at the very least, focus on the lesson this morning. Let's make sure that we are hospitable to everyone and especially to those we don't know because we never know when the opportunity that God puts right in front of us will not only be a blessing to them, but will be a blessing to us. If we can help you in some way to serve God better, to serve his church better, to serve others, even strangers better, if there's a way that we can help you, let us know how we can while together we stand and sing. Have you been?